Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I am Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today, I am joined by Kristen Polis, who is our GM of Industrial Cybersecurity. And Kristen is here because she has a long history in uh, the industrial networking and technology market, as well as industrial cybersecurity. And she, she leads up the industrial cybersecurity business for Tripwire. So, Kristen, we're here to talk about industrial cybersecurity. Why are we having this conversation now? It's relevant now because there's risk now. Um, I'm sure most of the followers of this topic now understand that this so-called air gap between the industrial world and the outside world has been eliminated. But I also think it's important to understand why this has happened. So the, uh, the next industrial revolution, call it Industry 4.0, or I've heard the terms ITOT convergence or IIoT, um, they might be used to describe this theme of increasingly connected devices on the plant floor. And these devices speak traditional IT, not OT protocols, and many can communicate with the outside world. This is a great thing, um, but it means um, that significantly more data while being made available uh, can help users make better decisions, it also means that this door has been opened for malicious outsiders. So with all the promise of the efficiencies of Industry 4.0, uh, cybersecurity maturity has to increase in accordance. And, and that's why it's important to talk about industrial cybersecurity right now. So let, let's talk a little bit about what what gets included in that that term industrial? I mean, there are a bunch of terms there that we use, industrial, OT, ICS. When we talk about industrial cybersecurity, what are we really talking about in terms of, of the environment, the devices? Sometimes it, it might be referred to as OT or ICS. And in fact, I, I often get the question, are OT and ICS the same thing? Are they a, a Venn diagram? Um, so, so OT is what is in scope for industrial cybersecurity, and that refers to um, operational technology um, that's any computing system that's going to manage an industrial process. It's a really broad category, actually, and it's not just reserved for your stereotypical factory production environments. Now, the term ICS is also very common, um, so that's industrial control systems, not industrial cybersecurity, industrial control systems. Um, that's a major subset of OT, um, and these are subsystems that control industrial processes. So if you, you think about it as um, a big circle, OT is the big circle, and ICS is all contained within OT. Um, so an example here, maybe to paint the picture a little bit better, um, an OT um, technology might be some kind of monitoring technology for oil and gas, or maybe even something like an HVAC system. ICS technology, which again is all also OT, uh, could be things like conveyor belts, um, or sometimes um, you might hear the term SCADA or DCS systems. Those are all contained within ICS. Um, so it almost reminds me of back when we were in uh, seventh grade geometry and we learned that, you know, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. Um, all ICS is OT, but not all OT is ICS. That's interesting. I, I think that's actually a point for especially for IT folks who are starting to see more uh, more OT uh, responsibility or, you know, OT uh, entering their environment, I think that's a, an area of confusion. What what exactly are we talking about? And what, what counts and what doesn't? Right. Um, I, I think the example of HVAC systems is, is interesting because if you're, a, if you're a, an IT security practitioner, you know, those kinds of building controls are, are maybe the first place you're going to start really experiencing responsibility for OT assets as they become part of your network. Yep, absolutely. And when you think about building automation and smart buildings, they're absolutely within scope when we talk about OT cybersecurity. So when we talk about OT broadly, it, it really applies across a whole variety of industries. I mean, it's not just 
what you would think of as as manufacturing. Are there are there surprising places that you find OT or that people you know from the information security side of things should think about OT? Yeah, and and you're right. At not just your your typical factory floor, not just an oil well. So, uh, like we said, the, the building automation example is a good one. Um, but one thing that that's absolutely huge now. Um, you know, you think about logistical centers. So any kind of a packaging facility mm. where there's a, a mass, uh, you know, bunch of different kinds of packages or goods that have to be routed. Um, that's an ex- that's a highly sensitive environment to to cyber attacks and a lot of OT equipment there. Um, so those are a couple more um, good examples of where you you might not immediately think OT, um, but it's absolutely under the umbrella of OT um, cybersecurity. Well, and I think sometimes on the the enterprise IT or or even the enterprise IT security side, we we tend to think of ICS and OT as being uh, antiquated technology, you know, things that were never meant to be on a network. And, and there's a certain amount of truth to that in that, you know, in the the utility industry, for example, you know, these these systems may have a very long lifetime compared to, uh, you know, a, a container, for example, um, on the IT side. But there is actually a lot of really new technology in OT when you think about things like logistics, as you said, or, you know, you think about uh, an operation like Zappos or Amazon, where they're automating more and more of their inventory movement with with robotics. Exactly, exactly. And those are uh, more, like you said, more common now um, than even some of your your traditional uh, manufacturing or transportation or Mm. oil and gas examples. Um, more relevant for requiring um, cybersecurity controls. Yeah, so it's important that we kind of shift our, our thinking in terms of, of the modern, the, the state of modernity, or however you want to put it, for, for the OT systems that are out there deployed in, in these environments. Exactly. And I think that kind of brings us to the question of responsibility. In, in the past, OT and ICS environments have really been separate from enterprise IT, and, and as such, haven't really been part of, of uh, enterprise cybersecurity either. So who do we see today as responsible or, or having that responsibility for securing the, the OT assets an organization has? Yeah, it, there's been a lot of migration and, and movement here with who holds this responsibility. So, you know, physical security, that's always going to be an OT owner's responsibility. But, but cybersecurity is a different realm. The threat landscape's very different. Um, and because, like we mentioned, technologies are converging, Um, because attacks can begin in an enterprise environment and migrate to the industrial space, and because events um, can impact every single person in the company, Um, whether that cyber event um, impacts a brand reputation, production downtime, or or is maybe even a safety incident, responsibility for OT cybersecurity is increasingly becoming the responsibility of someone in the the C-suite, and this is likely a CIO or a CISO. Um, All that said, though, um, some of the most successful organizations that I've seen have implemented um, OT cybersecurity controls with a very strong partnership between IT and OT, and sometimes even creating new roles to help bridge the gap and translate each stakeholder's requirements to the other. So, yes, the ownership is, is shifting to the CIO, but real successful deployments are going to be executed with that solid partnership. We've also seen a number of incidents lately, you know, in the past, I don't know, know, three to five years, I'd say, where um, operations have really been materially impacted by a cybersecurity incident. And I I think some of them are clearly OT incidents, and some of them are are just demonstrations of how integrated enterprise IT is into the operations of of the business. The one that jumps to mind for me is the... um, the impact that uh, WannaCry had on Maersk, the, the shipping company. I mean, it, effectively, a you know a ransomware attack that that halted global shipping, which is a huge impact for a, a you know an organization. Yeah, absolutely, and and we've seen similar attacks. I mean, uh, power outages in uh, in the Ukraine, where something uh, as as simple as um, some kind of a phishing email that that came over on the enterprise side. Um, where somebody opened up the wrong email and uh, an internet worm travels across through the DMZ um, and ends up disrupting energy systems and there is an outage um, for, for four hours in the Ukraine um, on one of the coldest winter nights. Um, so, um, yeah, it can, can be something that, that starts totally benign and, and really spirals um, if the, the proper controls aren't in place. Mm. 
what I always worry about is when, whenever there's a you know a ransomware attack or a, an OT attack that that has a clear impact, I always worry about the attacks that don't get caught. Um, you know, ransomware is my favorite example because it it's an attack that has to announce itself. Um, so detection of ransomware isn't really a problem in the sense that you know in order to get the ransom paid, it, it has to announce itself. But if the ransomware was able to get in, then uh, less uh, less obvious methods of attack might also succeed. And so I worry about the the possibility that we're not catching everything, um, whether IT or, or OT in that case. Yeah, exactly. I completely agree. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. So we've got, in a lot of ways, two communities, um, you know, sort of the IT security community and the OT engineering community, uh, both of whom have have a shared responsibility for uh, the operational state of these assets. I, and, and they don't always get along together. Are there things, I mean, let's start with IT security. What do you think the IT security practitioners should know about the OT engineers and the environment that they work in? Yeah. Yeah, well, a few things. Um, so first of all, um, while this, this promise of, of the industrial revolution, ITOT convergence, it's a very promising theme. I think an IT practitioner absolutely needs to know that not all OT technologies have converged. Um, so it's going to be, first of all, important that they learn a bit about industrial protocols. Um, and, it, and it's important when they think about implementing uh, security controls that they think about tools and processes where they're able to communicate in both um, traditional IT and, and OT protocols. Um, second, I think you might have mentioned this earlier, the, the technology refresh cycles are completely different in OT. Um, in fact, uh, <laughs> some pieces of hardware even have these things called lifetime warranties for the plant floor um, because, um, you know, that's this old idea to put technology in place and, and never have to worry about replacing it. Um, now, OT refresh cycles, I think, are shortening, um, but there shouldn't be any expectation from the IT folks that they're going to be as short as the as the technology refresh cycles that are seen on the IT side. And so this means for them they need to be thinking more long term um, and as they're implementing new controls because you can't have downtime once a year when you're doing your your cybersecurity refresh. Um, your your plant managers and your your controls guys are are not going to be happy with that. Um, finally, I think maybe the last thing. Um, to remember is that some OT networks are older than the security practitioners who are now assigned to protecting them. <laughs> so they were designed before cyber attacks were even possible. Um, so when, when you get in there and you start learning about the, the network you're now uh, in charge of, it's not uncommon at all to see a flat network um, and what will seem to be a daunting task uh, to secure. So it's important to have a roadmap towards maturity and, and certainly not think about um, securing your, your OT environment with some single big bang project. It, it really is going to be a continuous effort. So does that mean that the, the security controls that we're deploying on the IT side now don't apply? to the OT environments? Well, it's a hybrid. So some of them absolutely do apply. Um, and you're going to use some of the same um, practices and controls. Um, but they will be modified for an industrial context. Um, so, you know, for example, um, you know, one of the most basic ones I can think of um, is uh, asset detection or, not, or anomaly detection. That's going to be done often um, through a passive means, um, mm. kind of a, a similar methodology that might be, you know, required uh, for a uh, for an IT environment. But the the way in which it's conducted is is custom uh, or or unique for an OT environment. 
Yeah, and I would think about, uh, you mentioned flat networks, so network segmentation, firewalls, those kinds of things. They, they, do they still apply in the OT environment or is that, as an IT practitioner, should you, should you just stay away from the tools that you, you're used to on the IT side? No, I would, I would absolutely advocate for, for using firewalls in an industrial environment, especially when it comes to securing some of your most mission critical assets on the plant. Um, I, I think it's, it's very appropriate to use those and to think about them in your segmentation projects. Hmm. But you have to account for the industrial protocols that, that the standard IT firewall might not, might not be set up for. Great point. Yeah. You, you cannot use that same box. Absolutely not. Yeah. Something to learn there. So then there's the, the flip side of it, right? So if that's what IT should, should know about, um, for the OT environment, what should the OT engineers know when they start engaging with the IT security folks? Um, I, I think it's important for them to have an appreciation and a nuance for the complexity of, of IT security, you know, where these these folks are really coming from. Um, IT security is a lot more mature and the, the threats are extremely sophisticated. Um, so I've heard IT folks think, you know, oh, IT guys, they overcomplicate things or they don't understand the OT world. Um, and I think what's important here is really finding a balance. Um, and again, this is why I'm a, a huge proponent of creating that security role to bridge uh, the gaps and bring the teams together. You know, there's this um, all familiar CIA triad, right? We, we talk about this mm-hmm. a lot. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, these are the three pillars of IT cybersecurity, and it's in a very specific and meaningful order. But when OT cybersecurity emerged, we flipped that. And it was AIC to put availability first. Uptime is everything. Um, and so that that's kind of, you know, some of the source of the riff. Um, I anticipate the more IT and OT converges, the more IT folks and OT folks have to interact, the less we're going to think about this triad in any specific order, but rather as three key security priorities of equal importance that both teams need to work together to resolve. Well, you know, it's interesting that you bring up the CIA triad because I, I find these interesting parallels between sort of the bleeding edge of cloud technology and adoption and industrial sometimes. I mean, at, at Tripwire, you know, I'm sort of in a unique position of, of getting to talk about both sides of that spectrum. And things like the importance of availability, when we talk to DevOps engineers or we talk to uh, SREs, site reliability engineers, you know, they have that emphasis on availability that in some conversations feels very much like you're talking to an OT engineer where availability is the first priority. And there's a point where the separation of um, security from that priority of availability occurred that on the IT side created this this split that OT has never really experienced. And I think there are some interesting interesting comparisons there where... Uh, maybe not technology approaches, but philosophical approaches might actually align pretty well. Mm-hmm. That's that's very interesting. I've never never thought about that, but yeah, that that makes complete sense. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit Tripwire.com. That's Tripwire.com. Now, back to your host, Tim Erlin. So we're in this situation where IT and OT are starting to converge. That means that you have uh, IT security folks who are finding themselves increasingly responsible for environments that contain OT assets, whether it's a, a plant floor, or, you know, building automation systems, what have you. Where should they start? If I'm an IT security engineer and I suddenly have this new responsibility, what's the first thing I should do or be concerned about? Uh, visibility first know what you have. Um, and again, this goes back to finding a tool that communicates in both those IT and OT languages. So you can discover assets that are communicating across the OT network. Um, and I mentioned um, passive technologies earlier. I, I think it's important to, to kind of find a, a balance and blend between both passive and active technologies um, when you're starting out with a, a visibility 
uh, project. It's, it's important um, to be able to find and identify some of the smart and connected devices. So I'm talking about things like HMIs or sensors, but it's also equally important to identify some of these uh, assets that haven't yet converged, uh, like a PLC. Um, too often, I think um, we uh, jump right in and, and we start talking about some of the more sophisticated or advanced cybersecurity controls for OT without making sure there's a, a full appreciation for, for asset inventory. So um, whether you do it with a clipboard, uh, which I don't recommend, um, but you can, um, or, or you find some tool that helps you, um, it's absolutely critical to, to know what you have first before you take on any broader um, cybersecurity controls project. And, and once you have that visibility, once you've accomplished that, what, what's next? What's the roadmap look like? Once you see it, protect it. Um, protective controls are going to include topics like segmentation. Um, you know, you've got these flat networks now. You might want to start thinking about how you're going to segment them. You can start monitoring log activity. You can start um, assessing devices that have identified vulnerabilities. So it's not uncommon at this stage after you've achieved visibility to start doing things like investing in firewalls or, or even something like a, a patching solution. Um, and from there, I think it's really more about continuously monitoring your environment. Um, once you are able to establish a, a configuration that, that you call secure, the, the right monitoring tools are going to be able to immediately flag when there's been some deviation from, from your definition of secure. And this is really a key capability, um, especially when um, organizations like to model their cybersecurity practices around some of the trusted industry standards or frameworks. So think about NIST, think about IEC 62443. If you're continuously monitoring your environment, you can um, make sure to check against any any deviations of configuration versus those trusted standards. Uh, that all makes sense. And I actually think that's not that different from from how you might approach a new enterprise IT environment. The the technology choices might be different, but the the core concept of, you know, start by knowing what's there and then making sure that you you have a, a sort of a configuration baseline to start with, a secure configuration baseline, and monitoring for changes, identifying risks. Those core controls are are often very very much the same, um, but we're we're headed into sort of a or we're in the middle of really a, a really significant unprecedented change with COVID nineteen, uh, driving different ways that people work and approach work. Uh, technology is impacted, of course. Do you do you see industrial cybersecurity having a being impacted significantly by by COVID nineteen, and, and what do you think those impacts are going to be? Yeah, um, from what we can tell, um, it's going to pick up the pace and demand a, a faster acceleration of um, not only implementation for organizations who haven't yet began to invest in cybersecurity, um, but also the, the roadmaps uh, of vendors are going to, I think, accelerate in the technologies that they start bringing to market for industrial cybersecurity. Um, the, the promise of ITOT convergence um, and this mass investment in new equipment that's happening um, at the plant floor to pave the way for greater production resiliency or manufacturing flexibility um, is going to mean that um, you're going to have processes that are better automated, people are able to perform tasks uh, remotely. Um, this all means that the threat landscape expands. Um, so, again, with all the, the promise of Industry 4.0, you're opening more doors for malicious outsiders and greater amounts of damage that can be done. So any organization that's thinking about how to operate in a, a post-COVID world or make themselves COVID resilient, that's a term I hear a lot, how do I become COVID resilient, um, you can't have a sound strategy um, that includes things like production flexibility, um, without also thinking about having the right OT cybersecurity controls in place. So the the drive there is going to be, you know, more IT OT convergence because of the need to support a more diverse set of, you know, working environments, if you will. And cybersecurity ha has to come along with that, basically. You got it. Exactly. Kristen, I really want to thank you for spending the time with us. Um, it was super interesting to talk about. Uh, I think there are a lot of folks who are seeing more information, more news about OT cybersecurity, OT attacks, or, uh, you know, OT adjacent attacks. And it's a topic that's going to, you know, require more attention from, from the information security practitioners are out there. 
Thank you, Tim. Really appreciate it. Hope it was interesting and educational for everyone who was able to listen. And I hope you tune in next time to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thanks. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.